coming up on Theater Talk. I am not of the ilk who receives any helpful sign. I will surely be passed over for anything divine. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and Paul Bungert and Alan Lane. Shows up. Angel Gabriel? Yeah, that's how Muslims believe the Quran came to humanity. The Angel Gabriel, supposedly, dictated it to Muhammad word for word. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, there's a terrific uh, new play, the Lyceum Theater, provocative play that deals with everything that's in the world today about Islam and identity and uh, the West and the East. It is by Ayad Akhtar, and it is called Disgrace. He is a, an exciting new playwright on the scene, new to us, I guess. I mean, I'm sure you've been around as long as Eugene O'Neill, but uh, this is the first maybe not, time. Maybe not that long. <laughs> this is the first time we've heard of you. The play has been very well received, uh, quite controversial, fascinating and provocative. Uh, welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, for those who have not seen the play, can you just give us a little brief capsule of what's going on here? And sure. what got you thinking about this whole topic and these people? Well, the play is about a a Muslim American corporate attorney by the name of Amir, who is the lead character. Um, and, and he has been hiding his Muslim origins from his professional colleagues. Um, and over the course of the play, uh, that information comes out and uh, it sort of has repercussions on his life. And sort of the other main storyline is really the disintegration of his marriage with uh, a white American woman who is an artist who's drawing on Islamic inspiration uh, as part of her work. So those two strands play themselves out over the course of the And play. I found the whole notion of um, uh, what you're doing with, with the idea of identity, subsuming who you are. I mean, he really has made himself the um, uh, de definition, if you will, of a corporate lawyer. Mm -hmm. I cut right to the chase. And he has made himself as Western as can be. At the same time, his wife, kind of condescendingly, I think, is falling in love with the, mm. the beauty of the Islamic mm -hmm. culture. It's time we woke up. It's time we stopped paying lip service to Islam and Islamic art. I mean, we draw on the Greeks, the Romans, but Islam is part of who we are too. God forbid anybody actually try and remind us of that. Are these people that you that you know in your life? Have you seen this happen before? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't write about something I don't, I haven't observed or that I haven't experienced. It just doesn't, I, I feel flat-footed somehow. I feel like I'm, I don't know what to draw from. I mean, in the case of Disgraced, I, uh, Amir is, is trying to make himself into the image of the American dream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the play, over the course of the play, his relationship with his wife, as, as well as the political landscape that we're living in, where you can't really even talk about Islam in a, in a, in a simple way, um, ends up sort of destroying his life. The climax of this play is a very chaotic and subsequently violent dinner party. Yeah. And you told the New York Times that this was in part inspired by a dinner party you gave with your ex-wife. Well, is that so? Yes, in a, in a sense. I mean, I would say that there's, there's a, I, I like to think that, that a good dramatic idea is the sort of coming together of three or four different ideas. And one of those streams that sort of begat Disgraced was a dinner party that I was at my house in 2006 where a group, multicultural group, two couples, uh, was talking about Islam. And some things were said about the world and about Islam that sort of in some very subtle way shifted people's relationships permanently. Hmm. And, and I, it occurred to me that that, you know, I sort of lodged that in the back of my mm -hmm. mind. Uh, and then three years later, some other streams came and sort of brought this out. And that dinner party turned into a much more sort of volatile dinner party than it actually was. But, but it always struck me as interesting that, that, you know, the simple discussion about politics and religion could actually affect people's perceptions of each other in an irrevocable way. The well, Muslim identity uh, question in your play is, is very striking and thought-provoking to someone like me who doesn't have any. But yet, I believe you said, well, that that's not really what the play is about for you. It's more about the relationships and the dramatic structure rather than the questions of 
the Muslim struggle mm -hmm. with the philosophy, which you bring up so so vividly. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I mean, I think that that as a as a craftsperson, as a playwright, I'm more preoccupied by the reversals in the story, the recognitions that the characters go through, the sort of reveals, the rhythm of those reveals. Those are the things that take up my time. The craft. Yes. But obviously, I'm working from my own experience, and I'm working from my own preoccupations. So my own stuff, my own worldview, my own contradictions, my own interests, naturally bleed through. But they bleed through in a less self-conscious way. I mean, it may, it may be difficult for some people to believe that I was not approaching it that self-consciously. I was really trying to tell this story as clearly and as in as well made a play well made a fashion as I could. Well you had even commented that you were surprised at what some of your characters said to you as as you were in the creative process what came out. But I, I did find myself wondering while I watched the play how devout a Muslim is this guy? I'm not, you don't have to answer me if it's no, too personal, it's but you, it's got you his know, paragraph right here, Susan. Right. <laughs> but I was certainly, as, as the lead character struggled with his right. great rejection of it and yet you saw the, the, the subtle ways in which it, it uh, it influenced him. It reminded me of the lapsed Catholicism of my family. Uh -huh. Yeah, that um, I wondered what your personal struggles were. I couldn't help but wonder that. Sure, of yeah. course. I mean, I think that I hope that that's a good sign. I mean, I think that that you know, I'm involved in sort of exploring this thematic or this subject matter, which to me is just a prism onto the universal experience of faith or the universal experience of American identity, all of that sort of stuff, over a series of works. And so, in disgraced there are some aspects of that struggle which emerge and there are other plays and a novel that I've written which other things are treated. You know? So in this particular instance, I, I, you know, I don't share Amir's disdain for Islam, um, but I certainly have experienced people in my life, like my dad, who do share his... Really? Your, uh, father, has, your father turned away from... Yeah, it just has a real profound disdain for organized religion in general. And, it, and at times, it gets him so angry that you sort of, sort of start to wonder what, whether it's productive to have that kind of intensity. But you, <laughs> I, do you, do you I think share, that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. Take it easy, calm down. I agree. Do, do you share where you find, oh, parts of this religion are very latent within me and influence me in ways that I wouldn't have expected. I, I, you know, I grew up in a secular Muslim household, but I was very devout as a kid myself. I felt, I turned to it, I, you know, I was sensitive to a kind of, I don't know, splendor and majesty in, in creation at a very young age. And the only thing that responded to, my, to that register of experience in my life was, uh, well, was Star Wars, you know, or, or the Quran. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I would say that I feel, you know, while I'm not a practicing Muslim, I call myself a cultural Muslim mm. in following the lead of a lot of my, uh, you know, Jewish friends in college who would call themselves cultural Jews. Um, I feel that I have been informed and informed by the Islamic tradition in beautiful ways, and also I have baggage that bothers me. So it's like, it's all of that stuff. What I found interesting, because I went through this myself, is Amir's wife, who uh, has fallen in love with a uh, Muslim culture, right. because that sort of happened to me when I was going to the Middle East a few years ago, and I recognized myself in that. And I wonder, is there a kind of patronizing or condescending thing that you get from white people like me, who, when we discover mm -hmm. the beauty of Islam, we, 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 oh, I love the mosaics and the tiles right. and all that stuff that she loves in painting. I mean, it must sort of make your flesh crawl when, <laughs> when somebody like that comes out. I think Islam is so beautiful. Well, I don't think it would make my flesh crawl if you told me that stuff, Mike. <laughs> but, but, but it's impossible not to be condescending, though, about it. I found but, but that it comes when from, I was. But leaving. it comes from a good place. It comes yeah. from a place of love. And I mean, I feel like in Emily's case in the play, she really does love it. So she says some really profound, beautiful things about about Islam. It's just that because she's not Muslim, the audience won't necessarily take her word as definitive. Right. But I wanted the field of the play to hold all of these oppositions. I wanted all the points of view to be out there. You know, in a way, I, I wanted to play, I wanted a, to write a play in which everybody was right. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually what reality is, is about. So we're all right from our own perspective. And then we're all wrong. And then we end up yeah. often being wrong when we try to put that rightness out there into the world with a kind of intensity, you know, that is perhaps not appropriate. Well, I like the way you sort of blow up um, uh, the, 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 the smug liberals uh, mm. in this play, you know, the, the, the Jewish guy comes in and of course he's tolerant and all this. You don't need to patronize You've me. You've been patronizing me this whole conversation. I think you can bear with being patronized just a bit. You don't like organized religion, fine. You, you have a particular antipathy to the one you were born into, fine. 
you maybe uh, feel a little more strongly about than most of us because uh, whatever, fine. It all comes out because everybody's a hater underneath sooner or later. <laughs> or, or, that every, well, or that everybody has a tribal identity that sooner or later is going to get triggered by something and that, that perhaps that's part of being human. And, and, and so maybe we just need to be aware, more aware of it than we are. And sometimes the politically correct discourse that we engage in leads us to believe that perhaps we are actually in a different place than we really are when it comes to those tribal Well, when I was watching the play and everyone was sort of, uh, their, their identities were coming out in full force, I thank God I'm a Presbyterian because that is the blandest possible <laughs> oh, identity and, you can have. And the we get upset if, we're lift, if we're the tee off time is late. <laughs> you're, you're so devout, darling. But I, I do uh, want to ask you, we've, we're coming off of the Charlie Hebdo tragedy uh -huh. and, and uh, I know you've commented that you sometimes get hate mail because you're taking some stances about hypocrisies and Muslim they, well, my, difficulties. Well, certainly. Are, are, characters are certainly doing that. Yeah, yeah, your characters are. Are, are. are you getting any, are you ever, well, I guess the word I'm going to use is fearful of, of, the, of some of the responses you get. Also for your wonderful play, The Invisible Hand, Thank you. about Thank you. a guy in Pakistani prison. You know, I, 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 I am not afraid, and I'll tell you why. I think that because the, I have, you know, well, let's say I've probably written 15 to 20 major characters over a course of four works now. And, and all the points of view are, are, are vociferously and energetically represented. I mean, there are people who are devout and peaceful. And there are people who are, don't know the Quran and are very fundamentalist. And there, there's all kinds of points of view because I'm trying to create a multifaceted portrait of Muslim American identity, Muslim Western identity. And in a way, I think the people who know the work come away feeling that there's a deep sense of respect and love for the work, for, for the tradition, yeah. even though there is this strong desire to critique and question and at times mock. I mean, I've always felt that becoming American as a community, but also as an individual, is something about gaining a little bit of perspective on what you've come from, picking and choosing what you're going to continue with, making fun of, discarding, all that is the part, part and parcel of the process of becoming an American, an American artist. So you don't get any disturbing criticism of those? Well, you know, I haven't gotten violent disturbing criticism. Uh -huh. I've gotten, you know, criticism from people who, you know, I had this, this wonderful woman in, in Austin who has written me now a couple of times after reading American Dervish, and now she just saw Disgraced a, a week ago and wrote me, feeling very, very engaged by the issues that I'm, that I'm raising, but also deeply troubled because she's devout and she wants to wrestle, she feels compelled to wrestle with what the material is, but she feels off put by some of the in extremity of some of these things that happen, but she's still in dialogue with me. So, I mean, I think that that's the most productive way to, to go about it. So there's some people who just, you know, dismiss me outright and say, you know, that guy is not really a Muslim, you know. His, his, his book, American Dervish, in the second page, the main character eats pork. How could he be Muslim? You know <laughs> right, right. right. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. How many Muslims are really going to see these plays, though? I mean, I look around the theater, yeah. and it looks like, you know, your typical Upper West Side 50 to 60-year-old couples going to the theater. I mean, are these plays reaching people like yourself? You know, I... I I hope so. I hope they will. I don't, of course, you know, not on Broadway. It's more difficult just because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it has a community with a particular history and 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 it is expensive. And it is, and it is expensive. I mean, I think at Lincoln Center, where, where the Who and the What and uh, Disgraced both premiered, there was an outreach to to the community to sort of get people to see the, the work. I hope that productions around the country, productions around the world. There's a production in Vienna right now. There just was one in Peru. There will be one in Japan. Uh, American Dervish just translated into Turkish. Get it in Paris. Uh, yeah. You know, that's... <laughs> I'd be fascinated to have one and of your plays in Paris they, right now. They certainly should make films out of both Disgraced and The Invisible Hand. They would both make wonderful movies. From your mouth to the yeah. studio's yeah. ears. All right, the play is called Disgraced at the Lyceum, a, a fascinating, explosive, dynamic, exciting, disturbing, and funny, quite funny. All right, Ayad Akhtar, thank you very much for being our guest. Thank you. Disgraced at uh, the Lyceum Theater, and um, the other one is called? The Invisible Hand. Yeah, well, we'll see that again somewhere. That'll be the that well, it just closed in, uh, in a New York Theater Workshop. Uh, the next production is at, in Portland in, ah. in the spring. So. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you, guys. Khalid may be a trainer, but he comes from a ridiculously educated Jordanian background. All the women in his family wear the veil by choice. It's not always what people think. It's a source of pride for a lot of Muslim women. First of all, they are probably wearing headscarves, not the veil. It's not the same thing. The veil is evil. You erase a face, you erase individuality. 
and nobody is making men erase their individuality. Why does it always come down to making the woman pay? Uh-uh, there is a point at which you just have to say no. So Michael, there is a really cool new musical happening now off-Broadway at the Vineyard Theater, Brooklynite. It has music and lyrics by Peter Lerman. And then he's written the book with our old friend, Michael Mayer. Not that old. He's looking great and well, fabulous. He's our young. old <laughs> With those very sporty glasses. Yeah. And as the Brooklyn superhero, or one of them, there's more than one, right? Uh, a superhero hopeful, a superhero yes. hopeful, it's Matt Doyle. Welcome, Matt. Welcome, you. Michael. And welcome, Peter. Now, I'm getting a sense just from looking at you guys, this is kind of like a hipster musical. Is this a really seriously cool musical, Michael? You know, <laughs> it could be. Yeah. <laughs> could be. It's definitely, you know what? It's set in Brooklyn, yeah. which is about cool. as hip and cool as you could be. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And we definitely have hipsters as characters. It's, it's opening um, February 25th. That's right. But your previews have not started yet, so Michael Mural, Riedel, Michael Riedel and I have not had the privilege of seeing, uh, seeing it, so you right. have to tell us all. Okay. Well, Brooklynite is... Uh, a, a new musical yeah, which yeah, okay. takes place in a Brooklyn that is in the very near future. Mm. It's a Brooklyn where uh, everyone wants to be. Mm. They used to want to live in Manhattan, but now they want to live in Brooklyn. And uh, that's actually almost right now. I, I was going to yeah. say, I'm, <laughs> it's pretty time, time's minute. caught up to you. <laughs> caught up to you. So how but, is the course different? of this interview. But here's how it's different, yes. is <laughs> that in this Brooklyn, there are a handful of superheroes who were created when an asteroid hit and released Brooklynite, a substance not found in our solar system. And the handful of residents of Brooklyn who were near the impact zone received superpowers. One of them who got the most powers was at the time a 13-year-old honor student in middle school, and she became Astrolas, who is the head of the Legion of Victory. <laughs> And she has, for the last 10 years, been leading them in making Brooklyn a very safe and a utopian kind of place to be. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> there's this kid named Trey Swiskowski, who is an orphan. His parents were killed in a terrible um, robbery at the hardware store that they owned. And um, he is dreaming of becoming a superhero. He's got a scientific mind, mm -hmm. and he's kind of an inventor of sorts. And he has figured out a way to recreate Brooklynite. He just needs someone to help him get the funding so that he can put this thing together and become a superhero. Whose story was this first, Peter? Your, your story or Michael Mayer's story? It's, the way it worked yes. is that I was, there's a br real Brooklyn superhero supply company in Brooklyn. They supply created, superheroes? It's called, yep, and it's called, it's by Dave, um, Dave, Eggers. Dave Eggers, the novelist. Oh, yes. Oh, right, okay. Created a series of these storefront um, stores for kids. There's a pirate supply company in San Francisco, in San Francisco and this is, a, Brooklyn, is the, a superhero supply company. So kids can come in, and they can buy cans of invisibility or speed of light or get capes, capes mm -hmm. and boots, and they take an oath and stuff. And in the back of the store, a, through a secret door is a tutoring center. So it's really this very cool thing. And these tutors come in and help the kids with their writing skills and imagination and stuff. Amanda Lippitz, pr mm -hmm. young producer, went to that store and she had an idea that a musical could be based on this store. Mm -hmm. So she came to me and I, st I said, okay, I don't know how that works. It's based on a place. Based on a store? <laughs> on a store. And, and she and Margot Lyon, yeah, an yeah. old friend of mine and colleague, suggested that maybe I would speak to Michael <clears throat> Chabon, yeah, the yeah. novelist, yeah. who we know is really into superheroes, right. mm -hmm. and his wife, Ayelet Waldman, who's a wonderful novelist. And maybe the three of us could come up with a story. And so I spent some time with them in Berkeley, right around the time I was finishing up with American Idiot. Right. And we came up with a basic shape of a story um, and characters um, like Trey and Astrolas. And we brought Peter on. Amanda had been working with him on another project and I heard his songs. I was blown away. I was yeah. like, this guy is the real thing. He should be writing the music yeah. for Brooklynite. So we, gave, we brought his stuff to Michael and Ayala and they were like, this sound, he's great, we love him. So we all worked together to, to, to um, 
come up with the tone of it and, and the basic, basic story idea. And then Peter and I spent the last almost three years now. Yeah, about three years. Wow. Um, writing the book. His songs are terrific and we're gonna hear we're gonna hear one soon. But we are, yeah. Give me a sense, Peter, of the, the style of music that you're writing in. Sure. Here? You know, I went to, uh, went to the Brooklyn Superior Supply Company in Brooklyn and I it's a place that really sings. You sort of go in and there, there's a there's a great vibe in this place. And the, I, I felt like the the world of Brooklyn now and sort of looking at the history of Brooklyn, it inspired a lot of music that's that's twentieth century uh, retro, and there's also a lot of contemporary stuff. So we have a lot of 60s and 70s superhero music, yeah. 80s superhero music, so sort of TV inspired. But then there's also a lot of uh, of of my world, which is you know today in Brooklyn and mm. today in. Now, Matt, you look like you could have been in Spider Man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of looks like one of the Spider going on. Spider Man <laughs> guys. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I'm yeah. like I'm like pre transformation. I think I'd like to be I'd like to be Spider Man. I'm just Peter Parker right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, definitely a Peter Parker ish quality. Yes. Too. Yeah. Uh, now oh, yeah. we we want to have Matt sing a song. I want to point out that you also have choreography by Stephen Hoggett. Stephen Hoggett, with whom I worked on American Idiot yes. and Rigoletto at the yes, Met. Yes, right. Yes. He's become a dear friend, and we've been we're really happy to be back in the room together. And musical direction by. By Kimberly Grigsby, who was fantastic and who was sitting at our piano about ready to accompany yes. you yeah. in a song. Now, I, we from should, Brooklyn can you say this? We should, can you set the song up? We should up say, for yeah. Me? Okay, so this song is actually one of the only more serious. serious. It's like the only <laughs> Abby song in the show. And at this point in the, in the story, um, all of Trey's dreams of superhero dumb have been crushed. Mm. And this is the moment where. Um, his, you know, his feeling of like, I'm one day I'm going to be able to save pe people the way I couldn't save my parents when they were killed. One day I'll be able to do that, and now he has to give it up. Oh. So that's what this song. I, is. I do have to quickly ask you: Is there yeah. an evil villain? There is. Who plays the evil villain? Um, uh, with, uh, his name is um, Nick Cordero, who <gasps> you know from. From Bullets, Bullets Over Broadway, Broadway the oh, yeah, most right, fabulous right, right, thing right, right, in that right. show. Yeah, he's All right. incredible. Yeah, Matt, <laughs> yeah. you can step over to our microphone okay. area. We're going That's to bring Kimberly you the at microphone. the piano. I 
Wham, bam, 11 o'clock number. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> All right, the show is Brooklynite at the uh, Vineyard Theater. Now in previews, and it opens February 25th. With a score by Peter Lerman and directed and written by our friend Michael Mayer. Good luck with the show. Well, and written by, written by Michael Mayer and Peter Lerman. Right. Excellent job. Brooklyn hipsters, both. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see you on Broadway. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good Thank night. you Thank so you. much. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>